it's always a pleasure to come to this conference. I can see it's growing, and uh, I look forward to coming again, and maybe Scout has some very good students uh, in the future. Uh, I'm going to talk about the next generation lithium ion battery and beyond. Um, I'd like to start with the, if these things work, yeah, with this very busy slide. I like it because uh, this represents the 2015 uh, global human energy activity flow. Uh, it's in the uh, 10 to the 15 BTU. What it says is that all applications besides transportation rely on many sources of energy. The only application which is transportation rely on one source. And the story doesn't end up here because half of the energy is wasted in heat. So not only we are relying on one source, but we waste half of it. So the situation is very unsustainable in the future. That's one thing that leads to the motivation of expanding electrification. The other uh, reason is at least in the United States, and I would say that China as well has the same situation. Uh, in the United States, uh, about, this is a little old, but it's about 20 million barrels is consumed every day. And 72% of that goes to transportation. So if you want to make an impact, you really have to uh, expand the electric vehicle in the market. And the last one that concerns us all is the green gas, green, greenhouse gas emission. Uh, this is the uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration with time. If you stay business as usual, you will see that within the next 100 years, the concentration can go to 700 ppm, and that translates to almost 4 degree increase in the earth temperature. Now, we're already seeing a lot of climate change happening now. Can you imagine if we have 4 degree increase in the future? I think the Arctic will be completely melt. Um, so obviously, we need to change path, and uh, the way to do it is to promote and uh, uh, also more electric vehicle in the, in the market. So, fortunately, electrification has a way, and I have to give a lot of credit to Toyota Motor Corporation that started with the, the hybrid electric vehicle. The hybrid electric vehicle is now commercially viable. Uh, you can see millions of vehicles in the market uh, because the battery technology used is very small. It's mostly power-related to uh, uh, assist in uh, the engine during acceleration and recover the energy uh, uh, in form of heat during the regenerated charging. Uh, so we don't have a big investment, and that's the reason why the cost of the hybrid is very low. Uh, the one that the United States focus on is the plug-in. This one has a tremendous amount of technology. You still have the internal convention engine, the electric motor, maybe two or three, if, depending if you want to all-wheel drive. Uh, you have a, a, a tank, a uh, transmission, and so on. So, and then you have a large battery. So you can see it's very crowded technology. So the requirement on the energy density is very high, maybe even higher than electric vehicle. And the last one, which is very popular in China, Japan, and Europe, is full electric vehicle, where the battery is the brain of the vehicle. Huh? So there are still, obviously, many barriers why we don't see millions of electric vehicles in the market. The future is bright. We can see the trend. Um, I've seen numbers of 30% uh, within the next uh, 10 years, uh, which is very impressive if that happened. And the reason why it's still not happening is because there are still some barriers. Uh, one of the biggest barriers is cost, because electric vehicles in the market, you know, you can buy Tesla, if you can spend $130,000, um, but uh, not every average Joe can afford that. So cost is the key barrier, and I think most of the battery company will agree with me. Huh? Uh, but the cost is connected to energy. Uh, I will show you. If you have a small battery, conventional system that is a 23 kilowatt hour, 500 pounds and 125 liters. Um, and if you really want to reduce the cost, you have to increase the energy of the chemistry inside. Assuming, let's see, you double that, you will end up with the same energy density at the pack level, but the weight and volume drop significantly. And that's how you increase, reduce the cost across the board, active and inactive. Uh, I, I review a lot of papers, and uh, some of the students usually say if you move from a cobalt oxide to iron phosphate, you reduce significant cost. Keep in mind that the cathode cost in the pack is less than 10%. So you can remove all the cathode, you don't have a battery, and you reduce only 10%. So the key word, energy, is very important. So how to increase the energy? You can do that by increasing the energy of the cathode, or the capacity of the cathode, this is where the conventional system hover around, and we need to go beyond that, maybe 200 and higher. 
Um, you can do that by increasing the voltage of the electrolyte because some of the conventional cathode here can give you far much more capacity at high voltage, but unfortunately they are all unstable. So the cycle life is an issue. Uh, you also can increase the energy density by going to the increase, moving away from carbon, which has been around for 30 years, to silicon based. Um, that's basically at least three times. Uh, the silicon usually gives you about 4,000 milliamp hour per gram, but uh, the extensive swelling I will show you later will not allow you to use that. So you have to be very practical. 1,000 or less seems to be reasonable, especially the density of silicon is much higher than carbon. So I'm going to show you an example on the cathode, an anode, an electrolyte, and then I will move into beyond lithium ion to show you the future. Let's start with the cathode. Uh, this is a technology that Tesla used, the lithium nickel cobalt aluminum oxide. Um, if you operate at high voltage, you can get very decent capacities. This material has very high density, so uh, it's very attractive. But the problem at these voltages, or even lower, the cycle life is an issue. Here is an example. If you, fully, if you charge the NCA to 4.5 volt, you see you can get about 220, 230 milliamp hour per gram. But if you cycle it, you see the capacity drop very quickly. Um, so at Argan, we do have very powerful uh, institute tools to characterize and uh, uh, diagnose problems in the battery. So if you take, for example, a particle from an electrode here and microtome it in half and look at it by high resolution transmission electron microscopy, you can see you get the layers of the NCA and then you have a new phase through electron diffraction is nickel oxide and then you have another surface film. So this phase, if you take, for example, this material and remove lithium, you oxidize nickel 4 plus. Nickel 4 plus in an oxide phase thermodynamically is unstable. So you have an immediate reduction, you form nickel oxide, that's what we've seen here, and oxygen reacts with the electrolyte and give you surface film. Now you have lithium that has to struggle to go through this new uh, uh, surface film. And as a consequence, the interfacial impedance of the cells goes up significantly and the capacity goes down. So we know one thing, nickel rich can give us very high capacity and high voltage, but it's lousy in cycle life. So how can we fix this problem? And I think uh, Dr. Mattis mentioned that. We invented a new material called full gradient concentration. The idea here, and this is for the first time ever, a material that has multiple composition. Uh, to take advantage of the stability of some versus the uh, uh, activity of others. Uh, in this case, we put most of the nickel that give us high energy in the bird, and then we slowly reduce it and increase the manganese to stabilize the surfaces. So against the re reactivity of the electrolyte. And this is a, an, a, an EPMA that shows um, the intensity of the nickel is very strong in the burke and getting weaker. The manganese is weaker, getting stronger. The cobalt is the same across the particle. This material shows very high density as well, even though we're, no, we're not using 80% nickel in this case. Now, how to, the next step is, can we scale it up? Because you can make fancy material, but you can't scale them that are useless. Huh? So, in the, in the industry, the NMC that Argan invented used this process here, without this tank too. Basically, you take uh, a, a sulfate-based nickel manganese cobalt, you sand it, you have a coprecipitating agent and chelating agent, and then you coprecipitate the particle. Uh, this technology is mass scale in hundreds of thousands of tons. With this new material, what you do is just add one more tank. That's it. That's your investment. This tank will have a nickel rich, and this tank will have a manganese rich. You sand nickel and immediately start deleting nickel with manganese and sand both. So you have change in the concentration. Uh, with time. So here is an example that shows the, uh, the practical material that is used by the industry now for automotive, the 622, that's a nickel manganese cobalt 622 morphology and the new material. Um, you can see they are both made by co-precipitation, they have spherical particles. The difference is in the primary particle, so it can show you the, the morphology of the material can impact performance significantly. Uh, the primary particles are basically small particles, round, where the lithium has to go to the green, uh, green, uh, green boundaries. In this case, is a road structure. So you have the, the center here, the surface is here. 
and it's a gradient, so the composition is changing within that primary particle as well. And the most important thing is if you do a TM, a transmission electron microscopy, you can see that the layers of the material is parallel to the road, which means lithium will zoom very fast out of this material. This is very important. Now, if you cycle these two materials at the same potential, we'll very likely have more lithium moving here, more lithium moving here than here, which means you have more capacity with this material at the same potential. And here is an example that shows exactly what I say. This is the same condition for testing. This is the commercial one that is used in electric vehicle. Now you get about 178 million power per gram at around 4.2 volt or 4.3 volt. You get more than 220 with the other material. I forgot to add one thing. Because of the road structure, it's very packed. The density is much higher. That's energy. A lot of people neglect that, you know. They will make nanomaterial with very high capacity, but it's useless because you can't pack much more active in the electron. Uh, for me, the energy is voltage, capacity, and density of the material. Don't forget that, the student. So that's an additional capacity. So, because of the gradient concentration to prevent the reactivity uh, with the electrolyte, we can get a thousand cycle uh, and get still 80%. That's the requirement for electric vehicle, thousand cycle uh, at 1C rate, uh, and you still get uh, more than 80% uh, of your capacity, both at high temperature and room temperature. How about the safety? So, I'm going to see if this video works. The, 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 the cell here is basically an NCA that is used by Tesla. You basically charge it 100% and then you nail it to create a short and you look at the response of the cell. Because of the nickel concentration in high, we talk about it, when you have more than 80%, you create tremendous amount of oxygen release that causes significant exothermic reaction with the electrolyte and that's what you get. Now with the other material, because we are minimizing the nickel at the surface, or across the particle if you want. It's not working, I don't know why, but you can believe me, nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's strange. And you can see, here is the plot. In this case, because you are forming flame, the temperature goes to 600 degrees C within a few seconds. In this case, the temperature goes to less than 65 degrees C. So nothing happened. Now, the next step is to increase the voltage of the electrolyte because you can still use conventional system and get very high capacity out of them. And here is an example that shows the conventional electrolyte used when you go higher in voltage, the capacity drop. So they are not very stable at high voltage. So we need to find high voltage electrolyte. Uh, you can see once they decompose, they form a lot of films at the surface of the electrode from TM. And the best way is to use a floating test. You float the cell, like this one, which is a high voltage cell, and then you look for a leakage current. You can see that with high voltage, the leakage current increases, and that's a sign of the decomposition of the electrolyte. Now at Argon, we have supercomputers, so we can design many molecules that has very high oxidation potential uh, tolerance against uh, um, oxidation. And here is a whole bunch of them that we took. They're mostly fluorinated because they have very high room. So they are very, very stable to oxidation at high voltage. And uh, we did some uh, DFT calculation that shows some of them are very high, almost 7 volt. Those are single. Obviously, if you use a cathode, there is an activity of the oxygen on the cathode that can drop that voltage. But they are still very high comparing to organic electrolyte. Um, ionic conductivity is very important. So you can see it fully fluorinated give you about 2 10 minus 3, which is reasonably good for electric vehicle, mainly not for hybrid electric vehicle, but if you mix it with organic solvent to create a synergetic effect, you can go higher in, in conductivity. And you're not, when you do the leakage current, you can see at least 5 volt, there is nothing happening. When you charge this material or recycle this material, which is 4.8 volt cathode, you get more than 80% retention at 55 degrees C. This is very aggressive test. Not only you are doing at 4.8 volt, but you also doing at 55 degrees C where the kinetics is very fast reaction. And we also look at the, because fluorinated electrolytes are non-flammable, 
Uh, we looked at the flammability of this electrolyte. I hope this things will work. Okay, it works. So this is a fully fluorinated electrolyte. Basically, you, you wet a glass with the electrolyte and hit it with a burner and see if it catch flame. It's a little different from uh, what she did. I have to say that I'm very impressed with that electrolyte because most of the flammable, non-flammable electrolyte, they are non-flammable in a liquid, but they are flammable in the, in the gas phase. So the one you've seen from microgas is very promising. Now, if you do the same things with a conventional electrolyte, it catches flame right away and it stays until the electrolyte is burned. So that's another bonus. Not only we're increasing the voltage to get energy, but also we can improve the safety as well. Now, the final way to increase the energy density is to move from the carbon to silicon on the anode side. Um, as you can see, the, with the graphite, you have an intercalation process with a charge transfer. Uh, if you move to silicon, now you're creating a conversion reaction. You have an alloying process that takes place. Uh, you have a whole bunch of them. Silicon is attractive because it's cheap, but also it gives you the highest volumetric and gravimetric energy density. It's almost 10 times carbon. Now, obviously, it is very difficult to use all this capacity because there is no way to match that much capacity with a cathode that is 200 million power per gram. So one has to be very practical. We're targeting about 1,000, which is still a lot. So a lot the, the problem with silicon is the expansion, as you can see here. It's almost 400%. So when you have a particle that expands that much, in few cycles will crack and you get isolation so and that can lead to capacity fade um, basically like this you, know. you break down the particle I have actually a video that shows how you can see it uh, with using AFM let's see if it works so this is a, an AFM where you have an electrode that is cycled and one that is a reference so you can see if there is any cracking or not let's hope it works Okay, it works. So look at this button here. Once these things arrive here, when you start actually alloying silicon, lithium with silicon, pay attention to this one, which is scanning. Now you can see the cracking start happening during the first cycle. So with repeated cycling, you create isolation, and then therefore those particles that is isolated, they are no more active. Okay, so tremendous amount of work has been done by incorporating silicon in carbon matrix, either in nanotubes or yolk shell, a whole bunch of things. The only things that these have in common, they are not scalable. Otherwise, you will see the industry using it. So I'm going to show you a very scalable process that very likely will be applied soon. Um, the idea here is to use this uh, trichlorosilane. It's very dangerous gas. It's, it's used by the, uh, the wafer, silicon wafer companies. So it's high purity. They make tons of it. And then they throw it to make a wafer. And then you have all the contaminated gas get rejected. So they have to spend a lot of money to get rid of it because it's very dangerous. So you take that byproduct and then you put it in a reactor. You put graphene, dissolve the graphene which has layers, and then you reduce it because gas go everywhere, so it will go inside, and once you reduce, you get silicon particles which are in a nanophase, about 80. First of all, nanophase particles will not crack immediately. It will take a long time to crack. And once they crack, this graphene sheet will collapse on them and keep conductivity, so there is no isolation. Here's an example that shows without and with. Uh, the efficiency is not so bad, almost 86%. We develop, but I don't have time to show it, a new process of pre litiation And I think few companies have licensed it as well. And it cycles very well depending on the concentration of silicon you put in. What I've shown you, these are technologies that have been licensed and will be put in the market very soon. So if you take all the, and here is, a, here is an example of the, so basically the silicon wafer has these reactors full of this gas. So you throw in graphene sheet, 40 degrees C, and you get your material. So you hit two birds with one stone. You get rid of that dangerous gas, and you make a useful material out of it. Hmm? Uh, OK, so if you take this technology that I show you, you will be around here. 
If you add the pre litiation, you will be lower than the target set by the Department of Energy, cost wise. But if you look around here, the best material or technology is a closed lithium air system. If we can get this one, now we are way below and the cost will drop significantly. So I'm going to show you the new system we developed recently. How much time I have? Should I stop here or should I? 10 minutes? Okay, thank you. So, now I'm going to move into beyond lithium ion to show you this closed system. Uh, if you have lithium ion, basically you have an articulation process. Lithium will move from the cathode to the anode and back. In a lithium air, you have a porous carbon with a catalyst. So you have two electrons. When you send oxygen, you have two electron transfer and you form lithium peroxide. That's what everyone is talking about. Huh? So, but the capacity are 10 times higher. It's a huge benefit. It's a holy grail, we call it. The problems of the, let me show you the schematic for the students. That is what happened, basically. You send oxygen, you have the first electron transfer, you form a lithium superoxide that is very unstable, that's what everyone says, and then the second electron transfer, you form a lithium peroxide. Very simple, so. And in a discharge, you basically dissociate the bond, which are very difficult because the lithium peroxide is very resistant, so it's a very big challenge. So, in another word, if you look at this reaction, use air to drive and release oxygen when you're being charged. Can be better, huh? <laughs> so, but this, pro this system has tremendous uh, problems, huge problems. You can see the polarization is very high. Lithium ion is the charge and discharge on top of each other. Huge polarization. Capacity is very bad, obviously. There is also, when you send oxygen, there is an oxygen crossover that can react with lithium. So you basically completely use your anode within a few, few cycles. Uh, the peroxide that is formed is a solid, so it pl plugs the pores, so you don't have any fuel coming in. You will mean oxygen. So all these problems are, are very serious. Um, so if we look at the electrochemical reaction scheme of lithium air, you have the first electron to form a superoxide radical. This one is very corrosive. It will react with the electrolyte and basically destroy the electrolyte. If you have a good electrolyte, then the superoxide radical will react with lithium to form a lithium superoxide that everyone in the world, everyone in the world said is not stable. I agree if you use amorphous one, it is not stable. But uh, if you have a second electron transfer, you can form a peroxide, or because of the instability of this system here, you, you can, through the disproportionation, you form a peroxide. Now imagine, if you can stabilize this one and go this route, we have a closed system. We don't have any oxygen. So because in the lithium air, you still have to use oxygen, and oxygen can reduce significantly your energy density. You have a tank of oxygen. Same thing with the fuel cell. The only thing fuel cell has far more energy than uh, there is. Now I'm going to show you that we were able to stabilize this in a crystalline phase and open up a huge opportunity for the new system that can give us tremendous energy density. We started by putting a, a, a catalyst which is iridium. It's very expensive. We are moving from iridium now, but uh, we figured out a way to put a very nano phase, basically clusters of iridium which are less than a few nanometers, one nanometer or so. And when we tested this material, we find out that polarization drops significantly. Um, at the moment, we are almost at the theoretical value, which is about 3.1 volt of charge. Um, but it cycled very well. Um, the only thing is eventually you can't prevent oxygen crossover. You need a membrane. Uh, that's the reason why it drops. So when you change the lithium, you get more cyclability out of the system. So that creates a lot of curiosity. So we decide to know what is happening morphology-wise of this material. If you use a peroxide, you get more of like a donut type shape. It's very known. Everyone, if you go and look at lithium air, that's what you see. But in our case, we've seen a totally different morphology. It's more like a, a small needle, it's very nano phase. That cre creates a new system. We don't have a peroxide that we thought. And we apply a tremendous amount of uh, diagnostic using in situ tool at the APS because the hard x ray can give you an x ray within one minute. And you can see clearly that initially we don't have any peroxide, but we form a superoxide. And since you can see it, it means it's crystalline. So we now have a crystalline phase 
that seems to be stable because we can age it for seven days and still see it. And we did some Raman that shows clearly signals of superoxide as well. The best way to confirm that is through depth, differential electron mass, because you can measure the electron transfer. And you can see we have only one electron, not two. Two electrons will give you lithium peroxide, one electron will give you lithium superoxide. So now clearly confirm that we have a, a new phase that is very stable. Now we need to understand why it's stable. And one way of doing it is the, we looked at the structure of the catalyst. Initially we have iridium through TM and electron microscopy. Lithium react with iridium. So we have iridium 3 lithium. And if you look at the structure of this phase, it's almost isostructured with the crystalline superoxide. So basically the superoxide will be capped on this catalyst. And we've seen it uh, through TM that most of the superoxide are nearby the catalyst. So that's uh, the reason why we stabilize this system. And my colleague uh, Larry has done some DFT calculation which he proved actually you have no barrier when you have the amorphous superoxide, but when you have a crystalline, the barrier is very high, which means it's very stable. And he also looked at the, what you call DFT density of state, that shows that it's conductive. Key word, conductive means easy to dissociate, so you can get very light, nice cyclability. Uh, versus large band bulk Li222, which is very resistive. It's very difficult to break down those bonds. But that's why you don't have any cyclability. Huh? So based on this, we develop a system. Uh, let me just put this. So you can see, if you have this, you get that much energy. If you add another electron transfer, you get that much. And if you have three electron transfer, you get huge capacity. We're talking about 300 watt hour per kilogram. This is 3,500 watt hour per kilogram. So more than 10 times. If we can make this, now we're talking about maybe $20 or so a kilowatt hour. Hmm? So I'll show you a demo of this system. We were able to put some cobalt, which is not the best catalyst, and we were able to cycle this material for 200. And through Raman, you can see we move from the superoxide to the peroxide and back. So there is a demo that is shown, and we're working now on a different catalyst that can increase. Most of the capacity of the catalyst is around here. We get 600. Our target is get about 1,800. That's the target to get uh, uh, where we want to get on energy density. With that, I will conclude. So I've shown you that uh, the next generation is happening. You know, Microgas has license, so we're working with them. And there are other who are discussing to license its technology. The full gradient, they may be the first, I would say, they scale up that material already to a ton level per day um, because of the ease of doing it. Uh, we show you the full gradient to take advantage of the compositional change to enhance the stability, both for cycle life and safety. I show you a new process uh, where we can scale up the silicon graphene material. I did not show you the pre litiation unfortunately, because of time, maybe next time. And I'll show you a high voltage electrolyte that has some non flammable electrolyte uh, functionality. And this is something that we have to watch. Thank you.